So I'm building up a cable to load a program into my ZX Spectrum. At the moment I've got a stereo jack to jack I stole off Dave's desk. Sorry Dave. Um, and I'm just about to modify it to be mono. One of these will carry ground and we need to work out which one it is. There we go. So let's try loading this in now. Nothing coming out there at all now. Nope. Let's make it louder. Amplify. Tape loading error. All right, let's try again. Maybe not quite so loud. There we go. Is that what we're looking for? Yeah. We've got a QR code. Yeah, there we are. So we end up going to the fictional computer games company and you can see the games. Netflix released a special interactive movie of their TV series Black Mirror that started on Channel 4 by Charlie Brooker called Bandersnatch. And for people like me and for people like Sean who's filming this, it was set in the 1980s so there's a real sense of nostalgia. One thing that was interesting is if you selected one particular set of endings you could get to a point where the main character would be selecting a tape, put it into play and you would hear a noise like this. And to some people, they sort of think that, well, that sounds like a modem starting up. But for people who sort of grew up in the UK in the 80s, that was very much instantly recognisable as the loading sound for the ZX Spectrum, which was a computer I had as a child. So we thought we'd try and load that in and see what it did. We spent about two hours trying to actually get that to actually load in, basically because the volume level coming out of the Apple laptop, the world's most expensive tape recorder for the ZX Spectrum, um, wasn't loud enough for the ZX Spectrum to lock on to the actual signal and load the program in from tape. So we thought it'd be an interesting thing because we haven't covered it before. We've looked at how discs worked and things um, to actually talk about how computers in the late 70s, early 80s used standard audio cassette tapes to store data. So you would it's certainly in the UK more perhaps than in the US, but over here, most people will be buying the software on cassette and loading it in off a domestic tape recorder. I mean, something like the ZX Spectrum, you plug your standard tape recorder in. Commodore 64 and some of the Amstrad ones were slightly different in that they had dedicated data sets or other data corders, I think they called it, on the Spectrum Plus 2 version, um, which were built in or dedicated for using on the machines, which solved a few issues as we like we had here. Let's see how we'd actually load something in. I'm going to use this one with the built-in cassette recorder purely because of the amount of trouble that we had getting it to load reliably. I think using the built-in one when we're loading off an actual tape makes a bit more sense. Um, excuse the Heath Robinson-ness of the setup here. Um, don't have the cables anymore so much. And I'm just going to rewind the tape like that. And so we're now loaded up the ZX Spectrum and um, we've covered that before. Uh, this is the more advanced 128k model. The ZX Spectrum 48k model will just come up more or less like this and so to load the program you type load quote quote hit return and then you would start the tape and the same procedure would work on something like the Commodore 64 with a few variations you type things slightly differently depending on what machine it was. So hopefully in a minute it'll start getting some signal. So what's actually happening now? Uh, not a lot. <laughs> As I say, I haven't used this tape in about 30 something years. What do the stripy lines mean then? The stripy lines are just a visualisation of the data that's coming off. We then get a sort of program title and it's now loading in the program. These stripy lines down here are actually a representation of the data as it's being loaded in off tape. It's what's stored as an audio signal. And so that noise you can hear is the data, the bits that represent the program, converted into audio tones, which are then loaded in by the computer. And so the program would then load it. And it would take a while for these programs to load in. The, the speed that these things worked wasn't particularly high, and we can sort of see that. So it take probably about three or four minutes for your game to load, or more likely if you're using a domestic tape recorder on some of the other things, you'd get to the end and it would say, are tape loading error and you have to 
rewind, adjust the volume and start again, which is sort of the problems we were having when trying to load the one from the end of the Bandersnatch movie into the system. But we did get it working there. Is that it loaded then? Is it ready to um, play? No, it's still loading. So it took a while to load the game in. But similar procedures, and you've got similar sort of screens on other machines. You didn't necessarily get the sort of weird graphics around the back of it. That was a Spectrum thing, although the Commodore 64 sometimes did similar things when it was loading software in as well. But this was definitely a sort of feature of the ZX Spectrum. The game's now loaded. You can barely see what's going on. Press the A key to start, W to increase angle, Q to decrease angle, R and P to rotate the club, enter to play the shot. But it does have some sort of resemblance to what you might class as crazy golf. So let's have a think about what's going on when we load something in. So what's happening is, is actually very simple. The way that the Spectrum generated the signal that went out onto tape is that it had an output part of its computer, which you could either take to be um, plus five volts, or it could have it being zero volts. And the computer could change this to create different patterns. And if it oscillates that between the two things, it effectively creates a square wave, which if you then played it, would sound like a tone. That sounds familiar to anyone who was using a ZX Spectrum. So what the computer could do is it could alternate between a positive value and, an, and zero volts to create a waveform which could create sounds. And so when it was saving the data, you've got a, a series of bits that you can lay out one after the other. Say you want to save about a thousand bytes, that's eight bits per byte, that's 8,000 bits yet yeah, one after the other. So we can write that and we need to basically take that and send it out as an audio signal. Now you might think, well, okay, um, I will just send the bits one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, and send it out across there. Well, if you did that, you would send the data across and another computer could receive it. But when you wrote it out onto an audio cassette, you probably wouldn't be able to receive the data again. So what you need to do is you need to modulate it, you need to convert it into actual tones that are audio tones like you would if you were recording speech or music and so on. You also need to be able to sort of get started and get into the actual program, know where it starts, know where it ends, know what how much data is going on. On the ZX Spectrum, your program would begin with a block all of the same frequency. And if you look at the code for the operating system, you can see that this works at around 810 hertz. And when you load a program, the computer can see that and it sees that oscillating signal at about that frequency and says, okay, I'm now coming to the point where I'm going to start loading in a program. And it locks onto that, knows that it's now expecting something. And at the very end of it, there is a very specially shaped pulse, which is a different shape that then knows that it's reached the end of the leader. So you get this leader and it knows it's reached that end. And it then knows that the bits that follow are going to be data. And so we then get a very small chunk, if I'm memory serves, it's about 17 bytes, which is a header, which describes the program. So if we go back to, to rewind the cassette. First of all, when it starts to flash in between red and blue, that's when it's locked onto the leader. So it knows that it's found the thing. And there, we get this bit here, if we just pause it for a second, it's saying program golf. So it's loaded in the header, and that header's told the computer that this is a program, which means it's a basic program. So it tells it what type of file it is. Is it a um, program, which is a basic program? Is it machine code or data? Is it a specific type of data? So that's telling us what it is. It tells us how big it is and where it's got to be loaded into memory, depending on what type of data it is. So it's, it loads up, that's all in the header. And when you type load, you can either say load quote quote, which will load in any file, or you can load a specific file. And if it doesn't match that, it will wait until it finds the next header that tells you what it is there. And there's another byte here hidden in the header, which tells us whether it's a header or whether it's data. And then we get another bit of leader, again, of the same tone, but it's much shorter. And again, that's exactly the same purpose. It enables the computer to get into sync with this. You get that synced pulse at the end to say this is finished. So if we restart it, it starts to load in the leader and now it's loading in the program. And this bit of the section could be of various length, we don't know. And it's just the data or the program. So these two sections here, they're not made up of one tone, but they're made up of two different tones. 
And so you either have a tone that is sort of this length, sort of shape, or you have one which is twice as long. So we send this if it's a zero, we send this if it's one. And so we get one complete waveform. And what the computer can then do is when it's loading it back, if you get the volume levels right, it takes the audio signal, which isn't really, which is made up of lots of very small fragments of different frequencies, either zero or one to make up the programs. It's loading them back in. It can count the number of edges it sees within a specific time and work out whether there's enough edges for it to be a zero or if there's enough edges for it to be a one and then reconstruct the data that's being loaded in. And there's a few bits of parity in there and other things so that you can check whether it loaded or correctly or not when it gets to the end. But it's then able to sort of process the data as the signal's coming in saying, right, I've seen this edge, I've seen this edge, I've seen this edge. That means it should be zero. I'll write a zero into memory. It should be a one. I'll write that as a one into memory and load the data back in. Now, obviously, when you're doing this, you want to make sure that your system is stable. And one of the problems with cassette tape is that as a recording medium, it wasn't that stable. If your battery started to lose power, often the pitch of the music you were listening to would drop because it was linked to the power and so on. And that was fine for music because most of the time it was imperceptible. You wouldn't notice the wow and flutter as it's called. For a computer program, that's a real problem. So what people did, well, what Sinclair did when they designed this is they chose values for how long those pulses were going to be, whether it was a zero or one, to be such that if there was wow and flutter, the computer would be able to cope if it was slightly faster or slightly slower and still be able to cope with the data. Commodore actually went slightly further. If we turn on the C64, they actually stored two copies of the program, one after the other when they recorded it. So when you saved your program out, it would write out the program and then immediately after that as a separate block would write out the program again. Um, similar technique using a series of long pulses and short pulses to represent the zeros and ones. So when we load in a program on the Commodore using its um, data set and it will start loading in, it would load the program in and if there's any errors in there it would make a note of where they were within the program and then when the second copy is played through it could load in hopefully correctly from that point, the bits that had gone wrong and sort of correct the errors and was able to sort of recover your program. You mentioned that they're given a memory address. Do then things just sequentially follow on from there? I mean, it seems yeah. to me that a memory address is a long bit of data in its own right. So the memory address um, describes where the first byte goes. And so what happened is that you would um, get a memory address and it would say load it in here. Let's say it was a screen on the ZX Spectrum, it would say load it in at 16384 in memory. So the computer would load in the first eight bits, one after the other, form them into a byte in one of the registers and then write that back byte out into memory at 16384. It then load in the next eight bits from tape and write that out into memory at bits 16385 and so on until it loaded in the whole bit of data and it knew how many bytes there were in the case of a screen 6912 and it could load them into the right places. Interestingly, these loading and saving routines were completely written in software. And if you actually look at the implementations in the ROM chips, each path that the program can go down has been correctly sort of worked out to take exactly the same number of CPU cycles so that when it produces the pulses between the two, they're all of exactly the same length, so they're all of exactly the right frequency and you produce the data that you need. And when it's loading it, again, it's counted so that it knows exactly how many edges have been found in a particular point in time, so you have to turn things like interrupts off. It's a bit like when we talked about writing software for the 2600, these routines are very carefully written. The downside of them is both on the C64 and on the ZX Spectrum is that they took a long time to load in the program. And so what people did, um, particularly commercial software houses when they're writing software, is that it would write fast loaders or turbo loaders. And all they did was that they rewrote the routines that would load in the program to write, load the data faster. So they'd use shorter periods for a one, shorter periods for a zero, which meant you could get more in the same amount of time. And so you could then load the program in faster. The downside was is that any sort of wow or flutter variations in volume and so on would make the program harder to load. Now from the commercial software houses point of view, that wasn't actually a problem because 
they could bit write these tapes out using professional equipment that would write a strong signal onto the tape which would load and work fine. You then try and copy that cassette by connecting two cassette recorders together. The copy wouldn't then load, which was great because it meant that you had to go out and buy the real copy. And so it actually had a benefit in terms of anti-piracy things, but also made it so the game loaded in, say, two minutes rather than three minutes or whatever it was. I think the Commodore's uh, given up, hasn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, it's not ZX Spectrum, is it? Going back to the sort of file that was attached to the end of Bandersnatch, after lots of jiggery pokery twiddling wires together and finding a, the right volume, we managed to get the program loaded into the ZX Spectrum. And when you run it, it's uh, a program written by Matt Westcott on behalf of Netflix last year to display a QR code on the screen. So it basically, it runs the program, it draws a QR code, there's lots of nice visual effects to make it look like it's playing off an old piece of videotape with occasionally looking like it's on a Sony TV that's lost lock. The amusing thing is if you follow that QR code, you're taken to the Tucker Soft, the fictional website out of the movie, and you can actually download one of the games that's mentioned in there. You can get a file that you can then play into a ZX Spectrum and actually play one of the games. So the amusing thing is, when was the last ZX Spectrum game written? 2018, it seems. Now I've got the token so I can load a value in, add the value from the register into it and store it back and hand the token. And now I've got the token again, I can load something into, it, into my register, add something onto it, throw it back and pass the token on. And I've got it so I can load the value in, add the value from my register, store it back.